I recently delivered a brief lecture and had a conversation about literature and the literature of Muslim world to the students of one of my friends. And this is a brief excerpt from that. I hope you enjoy it. Anytime you want to talk about literature of the Muslim world, you have to remind yourself that, you know, it's a world of more than 1.2 billion people, 44, more than 44 nation states, and then Islam as a way of life and faith has more than 1,500 years of history. So it's kind of hard to really expansively talk about literature from the Muslim world. But what I basically today want to focus on is, is that complexity. Most of the times you might have noticed in the United States, especially with the politicians, there is a, a reductive way of looking at the Muslim world. They are always seen as this monolithic group with maybe non-modern ideas and maybe with a certain degree of hostility. But if you look at the Muslim world, it's a complex and rich and diverse part of, you know, the world. I mean, there are Muslim writers from North Africa. There are Muslim writers from West Africa, from central parts of Africa, Asia, United States, right? There are Muslim writers from all over the world. Some of them live in their own nation states. Some of them live in diaspora. So depending on where they are, what their politics is, what their gender is, what their race and ethnicity is, that somehow permeates into their work. But by and large, when I teach or write about literature from the Muslim world, I am really always specific. I locate it, you know, within the historical time period in which the work was produced or the historicity and the cultural and political aspects of the author. Where are they from? Why are they writing about what they, what's in their novels? And what are the main issues that come up? So, for example, if you really wanted to learn, you know, the Muslim storytelling on a larger scale. So you start with the epic, you start with the Dastan tradition, right? And the greatest of all the stories ever told is the 1001 Nights, right? Alif Layla, Wal Layl. Now we don't know who the author is, but it comes from medieval Arabic storytelling tradition. Why is it important for American literary students to know that? I mean, when you discuss literature, of course, you discuss narration and what is a narrator, right? And an omniscient narrator and a narrator who is semi-omniscient point of view. So A Thousand and One Nights then gives us the most expensive kind of narrator, right? We get Shehrzad who is the storyteller of the storytellers, right? And uh, so that's one thing we learn. Now, if you really want to go further, Shehrzad in Arabic would be Shehrzad, but if you're in Iran, she would become Shehrzade, right? That would be her name, same name. And as you read the stories, what is it, what is the premise of A Thousand and One Nights? Okay. So it's a very misogynistic premise, right? There is this sultan, this king, and his wife was disloyal to him. And as a result, he is so angry at the women in his kingdom that he decides he's going to marry one young woman every day, and that woman will be executed in the morning. So that's the premise of the story. So his vizier, his prime minister, his job is to acquire these young women for the sultan. And finally, you know, he runs out of young women, you know, that the king could marry. 
So his daughter, Shahrazad convinces him, let me marry the Sultan. And he's like, no, you're my daughter. I can't do that. And she's like, no, let me marry the prince. And she marries the Sultan. But she brings along Duniyazade or Duniyazad, her little sister. So what Shahrazad then teaches us how to construct an unending story, right? But what Duniyazad teaches us that you always need a narrative, right? A person to whom you tell the story, who moves you on, especially if it is an oral tradition, right? Not the audience, right? But a narrative, the person to whom you narrate. So the way the story is staged is the first night, you know, the prince is on the other part of the bedroom. Shahrazad is in her bridal bed and her sister says, Duniyazad says, sister, I am bold, tell me a story. And so Shahrazad then starts her story. But she needs to be aware that the story must have ups and downs, it must have suspense. She needs to also keep in mind that the prince is listening and then she needs to tell the story in a way that as the sun rises and it's the time of her execution, right? The story has reached its climax, but not the resolution, right? So, of course, the prince is listening to the story and the story is captivating and all. So in the morning, the prince says, I'm not going to execute you today. Live one more day and finish the story. So now that gives her another imperative that when this story ends, it must weave into another story. There must not be an end. So she does that for 1,001 nights right? Which is three some years, right? So what does it accomplish? It accomplishes that in three years, the prince has forgotten his anger, right? And he has fallen in love with Shehrzad, right? So the stories then not only save his, her life, and the, but also change the attitude of the sultan towards women and towards his people. So that's why Shehrzad is the greatest of all the narrators, because she teaches us not only that the stories can save your life, but that they can transform other people, right? Even people as extreme as the sultan. And that stories need that intricate structure to keep the audience captivated, but most importantly, that stories are always told to someone. There is always a narrative. So you can take that from the Islamic older traditions of epics. There is another one that I taught, Dastan of Amir Humza, right? That is also called Hamza Nama, or if you say it in Farsi, Hamza Name. And that's also 12th, 10th, 12th century epic narrative. So what do we learn? Just like we learn from, from the Aeneid, right? Or the Iliad, there are Western heroes, right? So there is a Muslim hero. His name is Hamza, right? And he is this noble, flat character, right? He doesn't do much. He's not as fun as Odysseus, but so is you know, Achilles is, a, you know, not a very inspiring character. All he does is kill, kill, and kill. But then in that story, we learn what a foil can do, right? Hamza is this noble character who will never wrong anyone. He's a warrior. And he has this friend, his name is Amr. Amr does Hamza's dirty work. He's the one who's cruel, who is vengeful, who does all the machinations that make it possible for Hamza to be noble. So what do we learn from that is that for certain people to be noble or to have this aura of detachment and nobility, someone else, else must be doing their dirty work. How can you apply it to your own lives? I mean, think of it. If you have worked or if you do work in a restaurant or in a grocery store where you have your immediate assistant managers and then you have the manager, the regional manager, most of the times 
you'll have disdainful view of the assistant mid-level managers because it's their job to tell you you clocked in late and and you should be doing this and that and, and the senior manager can be this magnanimous person who's like hey i care about you here you know here is an extra money for you right but they get people from amongst us to do the dirty work of controlling us and monitoring us, right? That's how this system works. And then if you come into like the contemporary Muslim writings, it would depend on where are the authors writing from. So a couple of years ago, um, Abdul Razak Gurna won the Nobel Prize, right? And uh, if you ever happen to read his novel, Paradise, it's a beautifully written novel, right? But he's from Tanzania, right? And uh, so his stories are set within Tanzania. What kind of culture existed between the Arabs and the native African population? His characters, main characters are Arab, right? But the young man, Yusuf, who is sort of the protagonist of our story is also Muslim, but kind of a mixed heritage. But if you want to do a layered reading of it, the novel is a retelling of the story of Joseph from the Bible, but also from the Quran, right? And you will only be able to decipher that from the no novel if you are because he doesn't make any direct references to it, right? But those of us who are from the Muslim cultures and have read our literature immediately would say, oh, yeah, yeah, that is, that is, you know, the boss is the, the king of Egypt, right? And his wife, right, Zulaikha, she's named Zulaikha in the story. And so then you get layers upon layers of storytelling. And this is, some place Tanzania that we don't even associate with Muslim cultures. Right? You go further north, you go to Algeria, you will find people, you know, authors like Asiya Jabbar. I mean, wrote a beautiful novel, So Vast the Prison, right? And when you read the introduction to that novel, you know that this woman has read her Derrida, the way she speaks about language, right? And then when you read the story, the story is recovery of Berber language, right? Kind of a proof that it precedes Aramaic and it precedes, you know, all the other languages that we think are, you know, uber languages, mother languages. So here is an author from Algeria, not telling us a story uh, about the Algerian revolution, you know, but about the Berber culture, right? The Berber people who were sidelined by the Arab population in that history. Now, if you go to India, and I'm just picking these up randomly just to tell you not just how vast this corpus is, but how diverse, right? So if you go to the colonial India and just stay with Urdu, you will see uh, a novelist named Kuratulan Haider, right, who wrote one of the most beautiful novels of India, which is called River of Fire, right? Now, if you are a student of literature and you want to study Muslim literatures, you read the title River of Fire and it says a novel of India, you immediately assume, oh, River of Fire must be like an Indian, you know, trope or a Hindu trope or something like that. But no, the title comes from one of the poems of T.S. Eliot. Right, and, and so that tells you how transcultural these writers are, and the story. Then you learn the narrative techniques that she employs. Right, the story is told through four sets of recurring characters over two thousand years. Right, and and I could go on, but what I'm trying to highlight is that when we invoke the term Islamic literature or Muslim literature, there is a certain degree of scholastic and literary reduction involved there. We, we cut these large swaths of literary production to a manageable size. 
But if you are students of literature, live in kind of the pseudo capital of, of the world in terms of culture, right? And if you really want to read literature about the Muslim world or from the Muslim world, you'll have to understand some basic aspects of Islam, right? What is it that people like? What is it? How do they define a Muslim life? And then if they define it, what permutations are in there? What is Shia Islam versus the Sunni Islam? Within the Sunni Islam, what's the mystical tradition? What's the Saudi Islam, right? Why is it different from the mystical branches of Islam? These are the knowledges that you will need to have to really grasp and understand any novel that invokes an Islamic culture or Islamic way of life. And a lot of times people are perplexed when I tell them, if you are going to teach it, or if you're going to talk about it, you must first develop what we call an aperceptive mass. You must know certain things. And they are kind of, the Western readers are kind of always perplexed. But you know, I tell them, okay, I am from Pakistan. I grew up in a Muslim culture. Most of my work has been done in the United States. I've taught American students most of my life. Do you think I can just do what I do simply by saying I'm from Pakistan and this is how we do things there? No. We first learn how this culture works. What are its histories? What are its troubles, right? What are its politics? How does it work? We learn the language, you know, and then how is that language at metaphorical level, at literal level? We have come across and learned it, reproduced it, talked about it. And that's exactly what we are asking any American scholar and student to do. You want to talk about my culture? You want to talk about the Islamic world? Don't just reduce the complexity of any of these works to the meaning-making processes that you have structured within your culture. You will have to expand the tools, right? And learn about the Muslim world, learn about its history. And if you want to be a scholar, then you will have to go and read, you know, Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Al-Ghazali, Ibn Arabi, right? These are our people, these are our scholars. These are our philosophers. So these are some of the things that come to my mind, do better when people ask me questions. So, so do read good literature from the Muslim world, from the Islamic world, but be particular to which region of the world it is from, which time period, and how are the authors placing themselves? Are they placing them, themselves within the tradition? or outside the tradition as critics? Are they mixing what they have learned in the West and bringing it to their own cultures and then marrying them together? These would be some of the things to keep in mind as you read any of the novels or short stories or poems from the Muslim world.